uh, good afternoon, my dear colleagues. Uh, as a Russian site coordinator, I'm glad to um, invite you to the next session, which will be devoted to the studies uh, in the era for HIV infection and hepatitis C uh, in the frame of work package 4. Uh, this work was carried out by several research centers, them Karolinska Institute, um, the Institute of Virology in Cologne, uh, the University of Siena, uh, the Eurysis Network in Rome, um, the Public Health Center in the Ukraine, uh, the Research Center of AIDS and Immunology in Georgia, as well as Gamaleya Center in Moscow, and three clinical AIDS centers uh, in Moscow, Krasnodar and Vladivostok. Uh, some results of these studies will be presented during the first presentation. It consists of three parts and will be presented by three speakers. We have 20 minutes for this, and the first speaker is Francesca Salabini. Uh, he works uh, at the University of Siena at the Department of Medical Biotechnologies, and his research activities are devoted to the development and application of in vitro assays uh, uh, for the identification of candidate A3 antiviral drugs and the study of the mechanisms of drug resistance to antiviral drugs particularly uh, those uh, which are related to HIV-1 uh, and uh, emerging viruses. If the presentation is ready, we can move to the first part of the first presentation and Francesca Sladini will give us the talk. Uh, I th uh, good morning to everybody. I think that uh, Francesca maybe will uh, move the slides. Okay. So please go to my first slide, or if you, we prefer, we can uh, start with the Anastasia. I don't know if, anyway, we can start for uh, with my slides. So thank you, Marina, for the introduction. And um, next slide, please. Uh, I want to briefly introduce the, my presentation, remembering that uh, HIV-1 integrates strand transfer inhibitors have been the mainstay of antiretroviral therapy since the development of first-generation compounds such as raltegravir and elbitegravir. These molecules have been mostly replaced by second-generation integrase inhibitors such as dolutegravir and bictegravir due to the higher efficacy and the higher genetic barrier to resistance. And uh, for this reason, dolutegravir and bictegravir are now included in recommended first-line therapies in most of treatment guidelines. In addition, the second-generation integrase inhibitor cabotegravir in combination with the non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor rilpivirin has been recently approved by the FDA as the first long-acting treatment requiring a once-monthly dosing as switch option in virologically suppressed patients. Few years ago, the World Health Organization indicated to replace efavirenz with dolutegravir in first-line therapies, and thus the dolutegravir rollout has also been started in Russia. The HIV-1 epidemic in Russia and in the other Russian Federation countries is dominated by the sub subtype A6, and no data on the natural susceptibility of A6 isolates to dolutegravir have been provided so far. These data are urgently needed to exclude a possible increased risk of therapy failure as observed in individuals infected with A6 isolates treated with capotegravir in recent clinical trials. Next slide, please. Um, so, uh, for within the CARE project, uh, we plan to investigate the mechanism of drug resistance to integrase inhibitors uh, with the main focus on dolutegravir in a sub subtype A6 by evaluating the in vitro susceptibility and the genetic barrier to resistance. In addition, we plan to create a replication-competent molecular clone with a near full-length genome from A6 isolates 
that can be useful for further evaluation of drug resistance. Um, next slide, please. So I will briefly uh, show you the results of the, pre the most of the preliminary results of our uh, investigation. And uh, for the evaluation of the in vitro uh, susceptibility to integrase inhibitor, we created 23 recombinant viruses arboring clinically derived sub subtype A6 integrase coding region from sample available from our biobank and other samples received from the Institute of Virology of Cologne the, and the Gamaleya Center of Moscow. Um, known of the A6 sequences, harbored major integrase resistance associated mutation and all but one sequences had isoleucin at codon 74 of integrase. That is the consensus amino acid, amino acid in subtype A6, uh, while leucin is, can be found uh, in the subtype B. This variant, uh, it's important to remember that the, the isoleucin at codon 74 has been found to be weakly selected during therapies, including integrase inhibitors, in particular, uh, with particular interest in treatment failure of individuals exposed to cabotegravir. Next slide, please. So for each recombinant virus, we calculated the half maximal inhibitory concentration and the relative fold change value with respect to the wild type NL43 strain. The results of our analysis showed that all samples were fully susceptible to dulutegravir and bictegravir. As you can see from the graph, uh, all fold change values were below the fold change cutoff uh, indicated by the dotted line in each graph. Uh, similarly, all samples can be considered as fully susceptible to cabotegravir since the susceptibility is comparable to that of wild type virus. Uh, however, the fold change value for cabotegravir uh, has not been uh, determined yet. Finally, we observed that six out of uh, 23 viruses showed a minimally decreased susceptibility to raltegravir, as indicated by the fall changes slightly higher than the fall change cutoff. Next slide, please. We also started to evaluate the genetic barrier to resistance to dolutegravir by infecting the MT2 cell line with some of the recombinant viruses with uh, A6 integrase coding region and with NL, the NL43 and HXB2 wild type viruses in presence of dolutegravir at eight times higher concentration than the dose required to inhibit the 90% of viral replication. We monitored the cultures to detect the viral breakthrough, as indicated by the appearance of cytopathic effect induced by the replication of the virus. At the end of this experiment, we did not observe significant differences between A6 recombinant viruses and wild type strains belonging to subtype B. Uh, also, we did not observe uh, or uh, detect uh, emergent mutation in viral cultures. Uh, further experiments are ongoing with higher drug concentration. Next slide, please. Um, the creation of the replication competent molecular clone with the near full length A6 genome is still ongoing and uh, is based on the assembly of overlapping PCR fragments, including clinically derived sequences with the backbone of the NL43 vector. Uh, we are currently assembling fragments obtained from different sub subtype A6 isolates, and we are verifying those able to replicate in uh, permissive uh, cell lines. Uh, next slide, please. So in conclusion, uh, uh, in our data set, A6 integrase appear to be fully susceptible to integrase inhibitor, except for a few viruses showing minimal, minimal reduction in raltegravir susceptibility. Um, the virus breakthrough in in vitro selection experiments also 
uh, does not appear to differ substantially between A6 and the reference subtype B isolates. Uh, as I told you, uh, we are uh, we have experiments still in progress, uh, and uh, we also evaluate the, evaluate not only the viral breakthrough but also the possible uh, emergent uh, resistant mutation uh, at higher drug uh, uh, concentration. And finally, the creation of the full length uh, A6 is still in progress, and we believe that uh, this clone can be a, a valuable tool to better investigate resistance, not only to integrase inhibitor, but also to other drugs uh, and uh, also to define uh, the synergistic effect uh, um, uh, of drug combination. Um, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Francesca. Uh, any questions from the auditorium? I don't see them in the chat. Francesca, do you have any questions? If not, we are moving, moving to the next presentation. I must say thank you very much to uh, Francesca because it was very important for information and timely information because in Russia, uh, the treatment with dalutegravir is now expanding very quickly and uh, uh, two component therapy regimens will be soon registered. So uh, the data on the limitations of their use with regard to uh, sub subtype A6 will um, cause some concern. So we are very happy to know that they didn't come through. And now we are moving to the next part of the first presentation, which will be given by Anastasia Antonova. She works at the Gamaleya Center. She's a junior researcher and studies genetic variants of HIV-1 in Russia. Uh, for the moment, she is working on her PhD thesis, which will be devoted to the recombinant forms of HIV, which have spread in all regions of our country and nearest countries. So we are moving to the Anastasia's part of the presentation. Please. Uh Hello, dear colleagues. Uh, I nice to meet you, and uh, I want to present to you our results um, of molecular epidemiology uh, and new treatment strategies, current treat treatment strategies uh, in the Russian Federation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, according to task 4.1 of work pocket 4, um, sequences uh, from newly diagnosed patients were collected from the Moscow region and Krasnodar. And then the HIV-1 subtyping was done for 412 sequences uh, from this region, and the result of it they can see on this slide. As you can see, A6 continues to be a predominant subtype in the Russian Federation, but also we can uh, observe the trend towards the rapid distribution of recombinant forms. Um, and it's uh, um, worth noting that um, they observed the similar phenomena among the other collection outside other care project. Uh, for example, um, the discovered um, the dominance of CRF03 uh, between A6 sub subtype and B subtype and um, the rapid distribution of unique recombinant forms in the Vologda region uh, three years ago. Uh, early in the Moscow region, a B recombinance uh, prevailed among uh, um, all recombinant forms, uh, but in the current analysis, um, the most common among the recombinants were CRF02 and CRF63. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, there are two um, two samples associated the CRF63, um, but had different recombination checkpoints uh, and uh, hadn't quite matched with the uh, CRF63 genome. And um, now we identify it um, as uh, unique recombinant forms. Less genetic diversity was discovered in Krasnodar, uh, uh, where A6 and B subtypes uh, were predominant. <coughs> and uh, we also uh, found uh, a B recombinance with different uh, recombination checkpoints. Next slide, please. Uh, it's shown here. 
and uh, phyl genetic analysis is still in the process because uh, unfortunately they had some problems with PCR reaction um, from these um, samples from Krasnodar for collection for Kras um, with collection from Krasnodar uh, and uh, we tried several variants uh, of primers uh, and um, so far we have received only 56 uh, sequences and they continue to work. This belong to a circulating or unique recombinant form. Now we identified it uh, as unique recombinant form, but they supposed it can be a new circulating recombinant forms. Uh, most of the mosaic recombinant forms were found among men, especially among cohorts of uh, injecting drug users and uh, men who have sex with men. Next slide, please. We also est estimated the current situation of pretreatment drug resistance uh, and um, they received the following data. It's 3.1% uh, for Moscow and 12.5% for Krasnodar. We can observe a significant difference, uh, but uh, our colleagues uh, um, from Krasnodar had uh, repeated treatment drug resistance even before the start of our project um, free, uh, or maybe four years ago too. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, then we analyzed the PDR structure and it identified the most uh, common mutation. It is 65R and 184V or I for NRTI and 103N and 181C for NNRTI. The largest number of mutations um, was identified for NNRTI. Next slide, please. On this slide, they can see three recommended options for the preferred first line uh, antiretroviral treatment regimen for adults in the Russian Federation. Uh, and um, the identified mutations are predominantly selected under the influence of these uh, drugs, especially by F variants. Uh, this indicate the need to optimize or completely re replace the first uh, line RT regimen in the Russian Federation. And the more preferable scheme is the scheme this Dolutegravir, how they can understand because uh, A6 continues to be a predominant uh, subtype in the Russian Federation uh, and it's fully susceptible to this drug. Um, and uh, they have uh, a very good news for all of us, I think, but uh, um, that um, at the beginning of our project, uh, uh, only around 4% of people re uh, received this scheme, this Delotegravir, but now uh, this scheme is used in 30%. Uh, Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Anastasia. Any questions from the auditorium? Don't see. It. I I would like to take this opportunity to um, to once again thank the staff of the Department of the Medical Biotechnology of the Siena University, where Anastasia with another care participant, Yekaterina Zhnegora, completed an internship in, in 2019. Um, to be true, it was uh, the first time in my life when we were able to save. Uh, to send um, our scientists to the high level European laboratory. And so it was a very important experience for us. And I thank everyone, especially Francesca and Maurizio for the warm welcome and training in this laboratory. Thank you very much once again. Uh, and we are moving to the uh, last part of these presentations, which will be devoted to the future perspectives. Uh, in uh, the area of HIV studies, and it will be given by Anders Sonnen Sonderberg from the Karolinska Institute. Anders uh, is a professor and senior consult consultant of infectious diseases and clinical virology at the departments of medicine and laboratory medicine in Karolinska, as well at Karolinska University Hospital. He is a leading clinical virology expert in infectious diseases, chair of two divisions at Karolinska. 
among, among others, he has appointments for the Swedish Health Agency and in international institu in institutions such as EMA, ECDC, and WHO. Uh, he is a work package leader of the uh, work package 4 named HRE Molecular Epidemiology and New Treatment Strategies in Russia and Eastern Europe. Please, Anders, we are listening to you. Okay, thank you, Marina. Next slide, please. I will start with um, describing the overall uh, results. We have heard nice uh, detailed results. Um, I think what we have done is really good. We have established um, a database including clinical, epidemiological and virological information based on the cohorts in the different partner countries. In addition, the four labs in Siena, Cologne, Karolinska and Moscow have shared technical knowledge which has uh, contributed very much to the development of new techniques um, Francesca described. Um, some strains based on this and we have also developed, for example, next generation sequencing based on, on this collaboration. Using these viral sequences, uh, we have started and will continue with the molecular epidemiology and to see, uh, analyze how these A6 strains are spread over the region. Uh, in addition to Francesca's um, very nice basic virology research, such research is also done as you heard in Moscow and Karolinska and Cologne. We'll come back to that. We have also heard that an important aspect is not only the technical transfer of knowledge, but also the educational, uh, illustrated by the visits of young Russian scientists to Siena. Thank you for that. Next slide, please. So, in addition to what we heard about the basic virology, I just want to add what we have done uh, in Karolinska. Uh, we have done this cryo-electron microscope analysis of um, the integrase from the A6 strains. This is actually the first picture ever of, of that integrase. So, we are doing the um, uh, research on this strain from the atomic level over the genotypes the phenotypic behavior and culture. Next slide, please. Uh, the epidemiological analysis are done presently in the different countries. Um, this is an example from Sweden. We have analyzed all a, more than 8,000 sequences in the Swedish database using the consensus sequences developed within a consortium. The blue um, uh, columns are uh, pure A6 strain, and as you see, we had already in the beginning of the 90s, one or two patients with that. But in the around 2006, 2007, there was an increasing number of A6 strains in Sweden. Obviously, the number is not that high, but we can see that uh, the virus knows no border. I can add also that we also see recombinant strains between A6 and other subtypes, uh, which is uh, exactly in line with what we heard from Dr. Antonova. Next slide. In Cologne, Mikkel Böhm from Rolf Kaiser's group are now analyzing um, the phylogenetic relationship between the Russian strains, A6 strains, red, the crinan in green, and com in comparison with the A16 Los Alamos. This is the first um, step. To, uh, next slide, please. To the pool analysis. The analysis of all pool clinical epidemiological viral sequence data from, from Russia, Ukraine, Georgia, and the European countries. We will uh, continue and to, to analyze the spread of the ACE strain, how it behaves, uh, of course, pretreatment drug resistance. And we will aim at try to see if we can find any drug resistance in failing patients. But as you just heard, uh, we don't expect uh, so much strain, at least not in patients uh, failing on the lotogravir in the integrase region. Um, finally, uh, we will um, uh, do some more work on, on the basic virology, uh, characterizing off-target mutations, that is uh, mutations not only in the 
in the gray spatules in the FDR and the envelope regions. I would say that when soon or when we are finished with this, this will definitely be the most comprehensive analysis of the A strain, A6 strains done so far. Next slide. Um, well, we have indeed established a common infrastructure. We have um, uh, logistics now for exchange of knowledge and technical skills, which uh, have worked very well. We also know the partners' knowledge, skills, and maybe some weaknesses. This is really good. Uh, this platform will definitely be possible to use for continuation of the surveillance of the HIV molecular epidemiology and, of course, drug resistance. And as we already heard, there are new HIV variants coming up, recombinant virus in, um, in Russia and Sweden and so on. But also, of course, this collaboration and platform can be rapidly adapted also to these new strains, but also new other viruses. Next slide. So I would like to thank you for your interest in my presentation. And of course, thank you very much for the partners um, in, um, in the um, CARE Consortium and also well, as well as the funding from the European Union and the Russian uh, uh, the Minister of Science and Higher high Education of the Russian Federation. Thank you very much for your uh, interest. Thank you very much, Anders. Do we have questions from the partners? Uh, not yet. Uh, I would like to agree with, with Anders because uh, I think the main result of our project is the achievement of the mutual understanding in all the areas of research studies and the creation of a platform for continu continuation of this work. So when we collect, collected uh, the um, sample set data, it was just the beginning of the long way. And so the most interesting part of the work is, is ahead. I mean the analysis and we will make it together. I think we uh, will find many interesting things um, in this work. If we don't have any questions, I would like one, once again all the partners in this project. It was a great opportunity to work together and I hope very much that we will be able to continue this work. And now uh, I give the microphone to Francesca, who will present the next speaker in this session. Please, Francesca. Thank you very much, Marina. And I agree with you. I thank very much all the uh, researchers uh, who contributed to the um, results just presented. And I have now the pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Olga Fursa, who will give the next uh, presentation. Uh, Olga Fursa is a uh, uh, MD and PhD student at the Center of Excellence for Health, Immunity and Infectious uh, Diseases uh, at Rigo Spitalet in Copenhagen. And uh, she has been coordinating the enrollment uh, of the CARE East cohort and leading the studies on host genetics of people with HIV and on HCV treatment in the prospective participants uh, from Eastern Europe. Before joining CARE, she has worked in Russia as a, as a clinician and as a researcher. So Olga will uh, uh, speak about the HIV cascade of care and the factors associated with viral suppression in a person living with HIV in Eastern Europe, uh, giving, uh, um, uh, showing the first results from the, the CARE uh, project and what are our future perspectives. So, Olga, please, the floor is yours. Thank you for the nice introduction, Francesca. It is a great honor for me to participate in this meeting and to present the first results of the CARE project framework and the CARE East cohort. I will give two short presentations today, and I would like to start with the report in the HIV cascade of care and factors associated with viral suppression in people living with HIV in Eastern Europe. I will also briefly outline the future perspective of the genetic studies in the CARE East cohort. According to the latest UNAIDS Global AIDS report, 
Eastern Europe, together with Central Asia, was one of only three regions where the HIV epidemic is growing. UNAIDS emphasized an urgent need to scale up HIV prevention services, especially in the Russian Federation, and drew attention to a large gap between HIV testing and treatment initiation. To understand more on the HIV epidemic in Eastern Europe, a new and unique cohort of people living with HIV from Russia, Ukraine and Georgia was formed. The overall objective of establishing this care is cohort was to study clinical outcomes in people living with HIV and HIV HCV co-infection, as well as the uptake and clinical impact of antiviral therapy in Eastern European populations. During the enrollment period from May 2019 to June 2020, we managed to enroll over 7,000 participants from three countries. Two studies were developed within the CARE East cohort. The first of them is HIV outcomes study that collected clinical data and blood samples from people living with HIV who are seen for routine care in Russia, Ukraine and Georgia and had at least one clinical visit after the 1st of January 2016. Participants in this study were randomly selected regardless of their demographical and clinical characteristics and treatment stages. They additionally had to provide informed consent to deliver blood sample for genetic analysis. The second study called the HIV HCV outcomes study enrolled the co-infected persons with at least one clinical visit after the 1st of January 2016. Participants from Russia and Ukraine were enrolled in this study and Georgia did not contribute to this study for due to the successful national hepatitis elimination program, this population is different to those of interest for the HIV-HCV outcome study. A total of 4,035 participants were enrolled specifically in the HIV outcome study from May 2019 to June 2020. All participants were predominantly male with higher fraction of female participants in Ukraine and Russia than in Georgia. And the population of people living with HIV enrolled from Eastern Europe was relatively young with a median age of 40 years. Uh, the main HIV transmission route was through heterosexual contact, following by eject injection drug use, while the uh, proportion of MSM ranged from 9.7% in Russia to 19.3% in Georgia. Of all participants who were currently on antiretroviral treatment, 54% were on NNRTI containing treatment overall, while 28% were on integrase strand inhibitors, and 12.7% were on protease inhibitors overall. Uh, the largest fraction of participants on NRTI was in Georgia, equal to 66%, followed by instant treatment received by 20% of persons on RT in Georgia. Ukraine had the largest proportion of people on INSTI, while in Russia, uh, half of the participants were on NNRTI container regimen, followed by PI container regimen, currently received by 20%. Russia also had a largest fraction of RT regimens reported as other and not assigned to the three main groups. Over 10% of participants in Russia were on other treatment, at their latest visit. We constructed an HIV cascade of care for the HIV outcome study population to describe their treatment coverage and viral suppression among participants in care in the overall cohort and by country. Participants were considered in care if they have had at least one clinical visit or CD4 count or HIV RNA measurement within the care timelines. Participants were considered on ART if they received at least one antiretroviral drug from any class at the latest clinical follow-up, and participants were considered as virologically suppressed if the most recent RNA test was below 200 copies per milliliter for not all settings in Russia and Ukraine and Georgia have had a lower limit of detection below 50 copies per milliliter. Targets of 90% of participants in care receiving ART and 90% of participants on ART having viral load below 200 copies per milliliter were used for reference. Of all people living with HIV considered in care, 94.7% were on ART at their latest clinical visit overall, of whom 
81.3% were virologically suppressed. Subpopulations of participants who were enrolled in Georgia and Ukraine reached the target of 90% on RT, while in Russia, 86.6% of participants were currently on RT. The target of 90% virologically suppressed among those on RT was achieved in Georgia, but not in Ukraine, in Russia. In search of the possible reasons of the low viral suppression in Russia compared to the other countries, we also investigated the proportion of participants who were on ART for longer than six months. We found out that only nearly 70% persons enrolled in Russia were on ART longer for six months compared to 88% in Ukraine and 94.7% in Georgia. In a sensitivity analysis in this subgroup, the overall proportion of viral suppression increased to 88.5%, and this increase was the most notable in Russia, from 65.4% in the main analysis to 80.7% in this subgroup. In the logistic regression analysis, older age and non-injection drug use HIV risk group were associated with increased likelihood of viral suppression while enrollment in Russia and Ukraine, as well as a more recent year of HIV diagnosis, HIV HCV co-infection, and PI containing or other ART regimen were associated with lower odds of viral suppression. At the beginning of this presentation, I mentioned that participants additionally delivered blood samples for host genetic analysis. Over 4,000 blood samples have been collected for this cohort, of which host genotyping has been initiated for 1,500 participants. Unfortunately, the host genotyping has been delayed due to the pandemic, and we expect to receive the first host genetic data in the coming months. The formation of the first Eastern European whole blood biobank for people living with HIV and the continuous follow-up of the Care East cohort will allow us to perform various future studies including but not limited to the analysis of host genetic predictors of the HIV progression, analysis of phenotypical and genetic factors associated with ART effectiveness and adverse events, and specifically analysis of factors associated with discontinuations, treatment failures, and adverse events of INSTI treatment, which has been recommended as a first-line treatment but have not been sufficiently investigated in the Eastern European populations. Since the overall viral suppression in our study was below the UNAIDS target, future follow-up of the CARES cohort is also warranted to monitor the progress towards the UNAIDS target. It will also allow us to compare the RT regimens in terms of cost-effectiveness in the resource-limited settings, as well as to evaluate the effectiveness and safety of the new RT drugs, including those produced in Eastern Europe, such as l sulfavirin and phosphazid that are in active use in Russia, but not sufficiently investigated outside of the randomized trials. With this, I will conclude by thanking all the care partners and collaborators who provided this data, who participated in the patient enrollment and data analysis, as well as the CAR study participants. And thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Olga, for this brilliant presentation. And uh, I would ask if there is any question from the audience. Uh, I don't see questions uh, up to now in the in the chat, but uh, I have a, um, a question indeed for you, Olga. Um, in the previous presentation by Anastasia Antonova, uh, we saw that there are large differences in pretreatment drug resistance among uh, Moscow and Krasnodar. So it is probably expected that there are large differences maybe in large centers and smaller centers. And did you try to see if there is any center effect or predictors related to uh, this, uh, this factor? Uh, thank you. This is a great question, Francesca. Yes, in our analysis, we observed intra-country differences as well. Mm, especially it was in the indicators related to, directly related to the healthcare settings on the municipal level, such as uh, treatment coverage or predominant treatment regimens. Uh, since we did not collect the information on uh, the uh, 
viral particularities, we uh, cannot directly link it to the drug resistance data that have been presented. But this is something to probably consider as a future step in our successful care collaboration. Uh, actually, both in Russia and Ukraine, treatment options vary significantly, also depending on the region. And that became even more prominent in the HCV outcome study, which I will present later, because more centers were involved in the letter. And of course, yes, having more centers from such large countries was interesting, an interesting experience. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, this is uh, indeed um, a, good, uh, a good point for further analysis and collaboration among the different groups. I see that um, Antons has uh, uh, asked to speak. So please, Anton, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Francesco, and thank you, uh, Olga, for the nice presentation. Uh, congratulations. I think it's very uh, important that we will have a, a relatively large cohort uh, of, uh, of people living with HIV and also an uh, important uh, aspect of uh, addressing the, the co-infection. I was just... Uh, um, I was just thinking maybe maybe it will be more uh, uh, for for the panel discussion, but uh, I wanted to ask uh, to which extent uh, um, are you planning also to address the uh, TB within this cohort, or is there a protocol for uh, for screening for TB or uh, preventive treatment, and are you going to uh, also uh, generate data about the um, HIV and TB co-infection and also HCV TB co-infection? Maybe it's a, like a, a wide question, but uh, if you if you can comment already now, that that would be interesting. Uh, thank you, Anton. This is yes, this is very relevant uh, in terms of the uh, TB prevalence, uh, which is very high in Eastern Europe in all the studied countries, but especially in Russia and Ukraine. Uh, we have not yet planned any uh, TB-related research, but we have enough capacities to plan it, actually, because we have collected clinical data on TB co-infection in all these uh, study participants, as well as on the uh, TB treatment received by them. And uh, I know that this data might be scarce, but we will have it for uh, some part of the SCARE East cohort, and that makes it possible to arrange the project on TB and HIV TB and triple co-infection. And personally, I look forward to yeah, discussing it and maybe analyzing it, because I realize that in Eastern Europe, this is an issue of the highest importance. Thank you, Olga. Uh, I see that also Elena Vobch has raised her hand. I hope I spelled correctly her name. Please, Elena, the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon, dear colleagues. Uh, very nice to see everyone and uh, those that I'm um, familiar with. Uh, it's a very interesting session. Thank you for the great results uh, that are very needed, actually, in the context of uh, the countries in Eastern Europe and also Russia having um, in their national protocols certain new antiretroviral uh, medicines that are proposed for uh, managing the HIV treatment. Um, I was wondering uh, whether in the study specifically for Russia uh, you could identify uh, the breakdown of uh, those on an NRTIs uh, because it's it's certainly a particular interest and thank you very much for flagging that in the conclusions uh, that the new antiretroviral l sulfavirin that is proposed right now as a preference uh, for uh, HIV treatment first line uh, for us is presenting certain concerns specifically uh, because we did not find as WHO and we try to address this issue from different uh, perspectives with different partners, we don't have the resistance profiles and we would be open for Russia to actually collaborate on that because if there is really a certain effect, uh, it can be considered as an option also uh, when the guidelines committee is discussing the, 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 the approaches. 
uh, overall, but uh, the big concern is that the resistance prof profiles are not um, are not known for this specific drug. Uh, and the other thing is, um, uh, I'm pretty sure that the specialists in Russia that work on drug resistance share my concern. Um, Russia has a very high epidemic with HIV, so um, definitely a more public health approach to monitoring and surveillance of drug resistance is needed. And there were some efforts in the past to try come up with a national strategy on monitoring the drug resistance. So I wanted to also maybe put it as a discussion point for further um, potential interest to continue this also in the frameworks of this project, which would be very helpful as a joint effort in the region. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elena, for the points you raised. They are very, uh, very um, focusing on, on this work package in, uh, in the CARE project. And I think that uh, um, there are uh, several people entitled to answer. Um, maybe Anders uh, from the first presentation, would you like to answer about the uh, uh, resistance profile? and maybe Marina and Maurizio about uh, the um, uh, resistance surveillance plan. Uh, please, Anders. Well, may maybe if we discuss resistance in Russia, maybe uh, uh, Dr. Anton Nova can give a re reply to that. If she's still there. Anastasia. Anastasia. Yes, yes, Anast Anastasia Antonova. Uh, I don't see her now, but Anastasia, please, you can unmute your microphone. Maybe I can say some words about the HIV drug resistance. Recently, we completed the study in the Moscow regional, in the patients failed on um, the standard regimens. And there were more than 40% of patients uh, having the mutations to NNRTI among those who failed. So uh, the figure is very high. I can, um, uh, I can confirm that. And the, in, in other regions of Russia, we studied um, resistance in the failed patients. The uh, figure was very close to this. So I think we have some data on this. Thank you, Marina. Thank you, Marina. I, um, I hope we can exchange some information then, because there is a really uh, a very high interest from our um, colleagues in the HQ sure. to find out if we can find some more specific information for the guidelines development groups. Thank you. And thank you very much, Elena, for this note. Um, indeed, the, the work package for did collaborate uh, and is collaborating with WHO, with um, specifically your colleague Silvia Bertagnolio has interacted with uh, uh, Marina and uh, Anders, Maurizio and all the other colleagues towards the implementation of a pretreatment pre drug resistance surveillance plan. So we are really very interested in this. Um, Maybe, Francesca, I can, yeah. I can just briefly add Please. that uh, I, I strongly support the program for uh, a surveillance program. We, we, we don't have to, um, to we, we have to think that uh, uh, also, I mean, in, in most of the cases, we are worried about the resistance to non-nucleosides, which is uh, rather widespread all over the world and especially in low, low middle income countries. But uh, as, as Marina pointed out, uh, um, there is also resistance to nucleosides. And uh, uh, we know that dolutegravir is very potent, so we are all very happy that the, the, the whole world is going to, to roll out uh, dolutegravir in, and replacing efavirenz for, that's very good for toxicity and, and for uh, um, increasing the genetic barrier to resistance. But on the other hand, uh, we, we have to be aware that there are people 
uh, who got uh, viruses uh, which are resistant to the nucleosides. And since the nucleosides are the companion drugs of the lutegravir, that, that's very important. So we have to monitor that. We are not going to use the lutegravir in a suboptimal way uh, when when the companion drugs are not working uh, as we as we do expect. So that's a key point to to support uh, the surveillance plan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maurizio. Maybe Maybe just the, Fran uh, yes. Francesca, yes, please, Elena. Maybe just one note from us. Uh, um, there is a there is an ongoing debate in the region, and uh, as you mentioned, Silvia Bertagnolo, she's aware of that. We're working very closely um, about certain approaches to the surveillance of drug resistance. So the, for the for the countries with uh, high epidemics and um, kind of other issues of financial um, structures to support the HIV programs, uh, WHO recommends an approach of national representative surveillance of drug resistance that is recommended at least once in two, three years. And there are certain guidelines of how to do it for pretreatment drug resistance and acquired drug resistance. And we've been discussing that with uh, Russian colleagues, also Ukraine was advancing on that because there was an attempt to also uh, do a certain point. There are more countries in the region that are doing this. In the Western countries, where the number of uh, infect of new infections um, is lower, uh, there's a different approach. And now we are working together with our headquarters and ECDC partners to try to find a certain you know context of the region because not everything is the same in our region. So I would call up on this project to actually open a kind of like a possible collaboration in identifying the specific approach of defining certain questions on drug resistance because there are a lot of um, debates also in between WHO and ECDC. So that would be a very good added value actually for the countries in the East and the West uh, to con contextualize a little bit the approaches to monitoring drug resistance in, in our region. And uh, there will be a new probably um, global action plan for drug resistance. So that is very much a momentum when we can embark on something as a more collaborative. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. Very well received. So I thank you very much. I, I was really happy to listen to, um, to these presentations and to the, of the involvement of young researchers. I am proud of this, uh, that we can, uh, um, we can have uh, such a, a, a good uh, opportunity for, for young researchers. And uh, with this, I, uh, I leave uh, now to the um, 10 minutes break we have. Uh, I recommend you to be back at 12.35. I'm also very happy that we are perfectly in line with timing. Uh, so please don't don't forget that we have uh, uh, other very interesting presentations uh, starting 12:35. Thank you all very much. <clears throat> okay, maybe um, maybe let's uh, return to our session. We still have two presentations in this uh, session dedicated to HIV and hepatitis C, and this the. The second part of the session will be more focusing on the on the HCV, and our our, our speaker is Olga Fursa. She has been already presented, and uh, but just maybe there are some new people. I will just say briefly that, that she is a, a medical doctor and a PhD student at uh, CHIP in Copenhagen, and uh, she's uh, coordinating the Care East cohort. So that, that was the first presentation about the, this large cohort, and this. Uh, second presentation will focus on uh, um, hepatitis C diagnosis and treatment coverage in, in this cohort, uh, uh, focusing on, on, on Ukraine and Russian Federation. So there will be some results and, and future perspectives. So, Olga, the floor is yours again. Thank you, Antons. So th this presentation will be, uh, so to say, a logical continuation of the reporting of the data obtained from the Care East cohort study. 
Now I'd like to start talking about viral hepatitis C studies that have been developed and conducted in care. And the topic of my presentation is viral hepatitis C diagnosis and treatment coverage in the co-infected persons from Ukraine and Russia. Uh, so just a couple of background facts. Now that hepatitis C is curable, the global health sector strategy on viral hepatitis aims to reduce and in the end to eliminate hepatitis C as a public health threat. Uh, among its important targets, I would like to mention diagnosing 90% of persons infected with HCV and treating 80% of eligible persons by 2030. And though the latest reports demonstrate significant progress towards these targets on a global and regional national level, more efforts is needed to achieve both targets globally as well as in the European region. And Eastern Europe, with its ongoing HCV epidemic, uh, in our recent study, based on large pan-European Eurocida cohort of people living with HIV, Eastern Europe demonstrated the largest uh, diagnosis and treatment gaps in the diagnosis and treatment coverage of five European regions. On the second graph, you can see Eastern Europe in blue color, having diagnosis rate below 70% and cure rate of 22% of eligible persons in 2018. And of course, these large diagnosis and treatment gaps require further attention and further studies in Eastern European populations. We launched viral hepatitis C studies in care with an objective to compile experience for HCV treatment by use of direct action antivirals from across Europe to inform best practice recommendations for resource and access limited settings. This objective is to be achieved through two study arms. One of them, the HCV meta-analysis, is an analysis of extensive data from existing cohorts of HCV mono-infected and co-infected persons from ongoing European studies. And the results of this large study will be presented later by my great colleague and supervisor, Dr. Lars Peters. And the second study called the HIV-HCV outcomes study aimed to create the prospective cohorts of HIV-HCV co-infected persons from Russia and Ukraine to study HCV diagnosis coverage, treatment options and treatment effectiveness. In this study, we enrolled people living with HIV who are positive for anti-HCV antibodies and have had at least one clinical visit after 1st of January 2016. Uh, participants were enrolled from Russia and Ukraine, and up to now, a total of 3,342 co-infected participants were enrolled in the prospective co-infected cohort. Of those, nearly 70% have been enrolled in six different clinics in Ukraine, and 32% were enrolled in three centers in Russia. Uh, demographically, the enrolled participants were predominantly male with a median age of 40 years overall and the main mode of HIV transmission was as expected through injection drug use in over 70% of participants overall and in both countries, followed by heterosexual contact. Uh, in the co-infected cohort, less than 90% of the co-infected participants were on ART overall and as well as in Russia. We further constructed an HCV cascade of care for people living with HIV in clinical care who were exposed to HCV infection. In care was defined the same way as in the HIV outcome study. And then for those participants in care, a detailed nine stage cascade of care has been constructed for the overall co-infected cohort as well as by country. You can see the stages on the right part of the screen. Uh, so these stages were divided into the diagnostic part, uh, including the proportion of ever HCV RNA tested and currently HCV RNA positive among those antibody positive, and treatment part, including the proportion of people ever diagnosed with chronic HCV, ever treated, having sufficient follow-up after treatment, people with follow-up HCV RNA data available and cured, among the estimated number of ever chronically infected with HCV infection. For this estimated number, we used a regional estimate of 79% of persons who were serum HCV RNA positive in the Eastern European population of the Eurocida study cohort, but which is close to the WHO estimate as well. 
targets of diagnosing 90% and treating 80% of eligible individuals were used for reference. Uh, in the in-care co-infected study population, uh, the majority of participants were enrolled in Ukraine. Participants were predominantly male as well, uh, and uh, mainly acquiring HIV through injection drug use. Uh, the target of 90% uh, on ART was reached in the co-infected population only in Ukraine, but not in Russia. And uh, none of both countries achieved the HIV viral suppression target of 90%. Uh, of participants with known genotypes, the most frequent HCV genotypes were genotype 1, followed by genotype 3. And of persons with known liver fibrosis stage, uh, most of participants have had no or mild liver fibrosis, with a burden of stage 4 fibrosis of 4.2% overall. Uh, so of all anti-HCV antibody positive individuals in care, 38% had ever been tested for HCV RNA and 26.2% of anti-HCV positive individuals were currently RNA positive at their latest visit overall. You can see on the chart that the proportion of persons ever tested for HCV RNA in the care cohort was significantly higher in Russia than in Ukraine. Uh, only 260 persons, or 11% of the estimated number of chronically infected, have ever started HCV treatment in the care cohort, of whom 250 persons completed treatment uh, and confirmed HCV cure was achieved in 93 persons overall, which is less than 4% of the estimated number of chronically infected with HCV. The proportion of persons starting treatment was 7.5% of the estimated number of chronically infected in Ukraine and 17.8% in Russia, while the cure proportion ranged from 1.6% of ever chronically infected in Ukraine to 8.5% in Russia. Uh, overall, of uh, 260 persons who have ever received treatment against HCV, 58% were treated with DAs. In Ukraine, this proportion was even higher, and 73% of all people who were ever treated received DA regimen, compared with 30% on DA in Russia. Interferon containing regimens were, on the other hand, administered more frequently in Russia where 47% of treated participants received interferon with or without ribavirin. Uh, so our studies showed that the HCV diagnosis coverage was better in the participating centers in Russia than in Ukraine, while DA treatment uptake was higher in Ukraine than in Russia, and the cure rates were low in both countries. Uh, and continuous follow-up of this co-infected cohort will allow us to monitor the progress in DA treatment uptake in countries that are heavily affected by HCV epidemic, where the DA treatment uptake is growing nevertheless. Uh, it also allows us to compare the treatment regimens in the resource-limited settings in terms of their cost-effectiveness, as well as we will be able to estimate the rates of reinfection and retention in care in Eastern European population with more follow-up years in this co-infected cohort. I would like to stop here. I would like to thank again all the care partners and participants and my project team at CHIP Copenhagen. And thank you for your interest. Thank you very much, Olga, for this uh, very uh, clear and concise and very interesting presentation. It was a pleasure to, 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 to listen and to, to watch. Um, um, I don't know if there are any questions. I, ha I see already a hand from uh, our friend Anton Yeremin from, from Moscow. Maybe, uh, Anton, you can, you, can, you can ask your questions. Thank you so much. And thank you, Orgla, for the great and brilliant presentation regarding the project. I have a little comment and short um, um, question because as it was mentioned before, there's a huge difference between regions in Russia and uh, regions of different uh, countries such as Ukraine. And maybe have you considered uh, the analysis regarding this uh, site-specific uh, results regarding the study? Thank you, Anton. 
this is a great and a very relevant question because in this study uh, many centers were participating so there were three different clinics in different regions of russia including the far east region krasnodar region and moscow region and also six centers from different regions of ukraine were participating and interestingly the hcv cascade of care indicators differed very significantly by uh, region as well uh, so I mean the intra-country level differences and we further aim to look into these results and uh, we involved uh, the uh, investigators from each of the sites to provide us with more data on how HCV testing and treatment is provided at the specific sites and with this information we will be able to make some conclusions on these differences and we very much hope that you Anton will help us with this on behalf of the Moscow Regional Aid Center. For sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anton. Thank you, Olga, for uh, for your response. And then, while I don't see any other hands, I, I, I'll take the opportunity uh, of a moderator to reflect a little bit also on on your on your study and also on perspectives. I think, uh, first of all, Anton, I agree that it's very important to see uh, different regions because we know that in in, in Russia. Uh, currently, hepatitis C uh, uh, response is very different by regions, but it's uh, apparently there. There are some um, intentions to 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 make it uh, more unified and uh, and more um, scale up on a national level recently. But uh, regarding this study, I think it's uh, important to. I mean, I mean, we all know those who are working in HCV, but for maybe for other colleagues, we I have to say that this is very extremely. Um, uh, dynamic uh, uh, area and uh, what we see now it, we can take it as a baseline and uh, and I'm sure if uh, there will be opportunity to monitor uh, this uh, the, the testing and treatment coverage then we will uh, witnessing a very uh, fast progress in in improvement of the of the cascade because as you know that the, the treatment the DA have became available only recently and uh, also both uh, Ukraine and Russia also they have seen uh, a very uh, fast and, and still in the progress the increase to access to uh, diagnostics and treatment so uh, it will be very uh, very interesting to see how uh, these numbers will change and, yeah, and also the the proportion of interferon versus DAA I think as a, as a baseline it's a, it's a very good data but uh, we will see how how quickly we can see that the progress when there is a uh, when there is a, uh, when there is such uh, opportunity, and also uh, regarding the, the the cohort of HIV and HCV co-infected patients, I think there is a it's we consider it as a low hanging fruit because these are the, the part of the HCV uh, infected population which is actually easier to um, to uh, appro to to approach or to access because as we know that if we're looking at a more general um, uh, elimination uh, uh, challenges that, that, that it's mostly related that to the uh, challenges in finding the people who are infected but the people who are already in care uh, uh, those who are already um, uh, in HIV programs I think it's a really a great opportunity so I'm looking forward to uh, to, to, to the, the, the updates from from this study in, in, in next years. Um, if there are no more other questions or no uh, other comments, maybe we can go to uh, the next presentation from from, from, from Dr. Lars Peter Peters, from, uh, also from CHIP, uh, from Center of Excellence of Health Immunity Infections at Rills Hospital in Copenhagen. And he um, is, a, is a good friend of uh, also of, of, of WHO and uh, and we know him for many years and his research is primarily in uh, hepatitis C and HIV co-infections and he is a uh, lead of the of the large observational HIV uh, cohort Eurocida and uh, and and he, he will be presenting on the uh, HCV meta analysis. Uh, uh, research uh, um, work, work package six in, in this project. So Lars, if you are ready. Um... Yes, I'm ready. Uh, thank Excellent. you, Anton. Um, I hope you hear me well. So uh, I'll 
as Olga mentioned, I will present the data from the meta-analysis in Work Package 6, and the title of this presentation is called Real World Effectiveness and Factors Associated with SQR Fraud in a Diverse Population of HCV Infected Persons from Four Large European Cohorts. So the aims were to investigate the effectiveness of direct acting antivirals, or DAA, and factors associated with achieving a sustained biological response in a large diverse real-life population of HCV infected persons. And this was uh, to meet the deliverables uh, in work package six as outlined here. Uh, the study population from for this study uh, came from four large European cohorts and the data were pooled. Uh, most importantly, uh, they, we received data from the Georgia National HIV cohort, uh, data from Swedish Infica hepatitis, and data from a uh, cohort in Tuscany, Italy, and then finally uh, data from uh, the Eurocida pros uh, prospective, it's a pan European prospective cohort of HIV, HIV co infected persons. And we included all individuals with chronic hepatitis C who had initiated first interferon free DAA therapy and had at least 12 weeks of follow up after end of therapy. Uh, SBR 12 was defined as unde undetectable HV on A 12 weeks or later after end of therapy. And we used logistics, logistic regression to uh, examine factors associated with achieving SBR 12. Uh, this shows the inclusion of patients from, from the uh, four different cohorts. Altogether, we have uh, more than 76,000 uh, individuals, and among those uh, who had re received the AA and had at least 12 weeks of follow up, and among those, uh, 58,461 had a follow up HCV RNA available to determine SVR12. And the, the cohort was dominated by, by uh, patients from, from Georgia, more than 54,000 were enrolled for, from Georgia, uh, and 15,000 from Infica uh, hepatitis in Sweden, 5,000 from, from Italy, and then uh, 1,400 from Eurocida. Uh, there's a lot of data here, but I'll just highlight the most important ones. So overall, uh, around three quarters of the participants were male. Their median age was uh, 48 years, and 14% of those with known fibrosis stage prior to treatment initiation uh, had cirrhosis, and close to 50% had genotype uh, 1 infection. Um, so a lot of uh, more than 14,000 patients, um, or more than 17,000 patients didn't have the follow-up follow HIV on A to determine SVR4. And uh, those uh, who were excluded in the per protocol analysis, they were more likely to come from uh, the Georgian cohort. They uh, were more likely to be male they were a few years younger than the rest of the population, but importantly, they had uh, the same uh, distribution of uh, fibrosis stages and also a similar distribution of uh, hepatitis C genotypes. Uh, a lot of uh, a wide range of different DAA regimens were used. Uh, by far, the most uh, commonly regimens were Sofospavir and Ledipasvir with or without uh, ribavirin, as shown here. And this is uh, again, its, it's uh, reflex was what was predominantly used in the Georgian cohort. Um, so here's show, here, this slide shows the SVR12 rate by cohort and overall um, among those with known outcome. So overall, close to 95% achieved the SVR12, and uh, the lowest rate was seen in the Eurocida cohort, where uh, close to 93% achieved the SVR12, and in the other cohorts, uh, the SVR12 rate was between 94 and 
96 percent. Uh, this table shows the the, the SVR12 rates uh, in the different uh, groups. You can see that females had a slightly higher SVR rate compared to men, and there was also a, a gradient of uh, decreasing SVR12 according to age uh, and also according to stage of fibrosis, where you can see those with uh, cirrhosis only had an SVR rate of 85.6%. Whereas the SVR rate uh, for the different genotypes was remarkably uh, equal to each other or similar to each other. Um, this uh, table shows the SVR 12 among individuals with known outcome according to the different regimens that I showed before. Uh, generally, the SVR 12 rates were very high for the different regimens, but there are a few that stand out, uh, one of them is first pivot and ribavirin, where only 71% uh, achieved SVR12. Uh, and for that reason, is not included in, in current guidelines. There was a, uh, also relatively low SVR rate for those uh, patients received uh, so first pivot and velpatasvir plus ribavirin. This was a very uh, small group uh, that were predominantly uh, genotype 3 patients with uh, cirrhosis that are known uh, to be uh, difficult to treat. So this figure shows the, the, the result of the logistic regression al analysis and the odds of achieving SVR12 in those with known treatment outcome. So the older uh, you are, the less likely you are to achieve SVR12. Women uh, had a higher Odds of achieving SVR12, uh, so did um, uh, genotype two and three compared to genotype one. Uh, but and those with fibrosis stage four had a lower odds of achieving SVR12 compared with stage zero and one. But interestingly, interestingly, we also saw saw a, a gradient of lower odds of SVR12 in the intermediate fibrosis stages. For the different DAA regimens, you can see that that for those drugs that we are uh, currently using, the, uh, they had a similar odds of achieving SVR compared to sofosbevir and lidipasvir, but it was lower for, for uh, sofosbevir and ribavirin, for example. Uh, next, we performed a range of subgroup analysis and that included people receiving contemporary DAA regimens and people with cirrhosis. Individual, we looked at individual HIV genotypes and we looked at women uh, separately. I'll just show you a couple of these analysis, uh, analysis here. So for those with cirrhosis, um, I mentioned before SVR 12 overall, 85.6. Uh, and here, the difference between men and women was, uh, was even greater. Uh, we saw a similar um, um, age, uh, uh, similar differences between the age, age groups, uh, and also uh, uh, similar SVR rates for the different genotypes. Uh, this slide shows this, uh, again among those with cirrhosis uh, for the different DAA regimens, and. And the different regimens work uh, pretty well, except for uh, soft, uh, soft and ribavirin, which was uh, driven, driven the, the signal. I'll show you more about that in a later slide. And again, here the odds of achieving SPR12 among those with, uh, with a known treatment outcome and cirrhosis. Uh, the, the, the trends are uh, are very similar to what I showed you before with uh, slightly lower odds uh, in the older population and, and, and higher odds in women uh, versus males. Uh, for the, the last subgroup analysis um, I will uh, tell you about is um, an analysis where we looked at SBR12 among individuals with known outcome receiving contemporary regimens and by contemporary regimens we need we mean those DAA regimens that are currently recommended by the international treatment guidelines. 
And here you can see an overall SVR rate of 96.5%, uh, uh, so very high, uh, and also very high for, for, the, for the different age group, even in the older population of those older than 55, and a relatively high SVR rates among those with F4, uh, which is cirrhosis. Uh, and high SVR rates for the different genotypes as well. Um, and again, for for those uh, for those uh, regimens that are currently uh, recommended by the guidelines, uh, nearly all of them uh, perform uh, very well uh, in those with cirrhosis. Again, this small group here who receives sovospivir and velpatasvir uh, plus arrival stands out a little bit, but based on only a little more than 200 individuals. And here the the results from the logistic uh, regression analysis. The, the picture is uh, similar to what I showed you for the primary analysis. So to conclude, um, in this uh, large diverse population of more than 58,000 HIV infected persons with known SVR12 status, the overall SVR12 rate was 94.8% and 96.5% among those on contemporary regimens. We observed a gradual decrease in SVR12 with increasing age and fibrosis stage, and our findings support early DAA therapy for all, for all HIV-infected individuals using DAA regimens rec recommended by current guidelines to optimize treatment outcomes. And finally, I, I want to Thanks all the partners in the care consortium, uh, especially uh, partners from, from the four cohorts that have contributed data to this analysis. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lars. Uh, again, for excellent presentations, as always. Um, yeah, uh, while I don't see any hands, uh, I also want to reflect a little bit. I think it's really, again, very important uh, work and uh, uh, taking into account that the large, um, the large sample size and also that the, the fact that it covers uh, different parts of our region, I think it will be very important data. Um, uh, also, I was just thinking maybe because now we are developing the, the new global strategy, maybe regional action plan, and we have a target of the, um, uh, of the uh, SVR rates and it, it kind of, Globally, it's still considered 90% is a target, but now we can see what if if the uh, contemporary uh, recommendations are followed, then we can easily uh, aim for at least 95% uh, SVR rate uh, overall. So I think it's a really uh, good evidence and also motivations for 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 everybody who is involved in in hepatitis C care. Um, I don't know if. Anybody has any question or um, any further comment? I would um, thank you very much, Hans, uh, and all the speakers. And uh, uh, I would comment, I would ask you to comment uh, on this very uh, large data sets and data collection that. Uh, uh, you you talked about and uh, uh, that was collected within the care project. I imagine and I know that it has not been uh, so easy, but um, maybe I ask all, all the speakers of the session if you can uh, say in your perspective what could make it possible to collect such a huge amount of information, of usable, meaningful information. So, so I, I, I can I can definitely start. So, um, so, uh, so the participating cohorts, cohorts they they already have um, the databases. They they didn't start from 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 scratch, uh, obviously. Um, but where Eurocida is is more like a prospective co cohort with a lot of the uh, data variables collected prospectively. The other cohorts are more um, uh, treatment databases with a, with a smaller uh, number of, of variables, but 
but they one important step is uh, to to be able to exchange all these uh, data in in the right format and there <clears throat> at ship yeah uh, we have a lot of experience in that uh, we have uh, something called the uh, heat that systems for for HIV data exchange uh, so we we develop a SOP with uh, with names for the different variables and and then we have a, a submission system that we that, that we use for online submission system that we use for for our different cohort studies uh, where we have built in uh, a lot of checks and and you can invent almost any check you want to to make sure that the data are coming in in the right format uh, without any uh, or with with minimizing the the risk of errors in incoming data so it's it's built on it builds on on years of uh, experience with uh, collecting hiv data thank you thank you olga you may want to add yes if I might add something uh, for the prospect forward, I'm sorry, Lars, can you mute? Lars, can you mute? Sorry. Uh, so for the prospect forward, we have started from the crash and collected all this data within a year, which requires significant effort from the teams in Russia and in Ukraine and we would like to give them the credit for filling out all the online forms. We also tried to facilitate the process from our side by translating all the forms into Russian, as well as uh, conducting the training for the project investigators, also in Russian language. And not to mention that uh, the team is cheap, has helped in it a lot since they have an excellent track of their collaboration with Eastern Europe. So I think uh, I would acknowledge every participating partner and I agree that was a very challenging and difficult task that we were nevertheless able to accomplish together. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I can see in, in Nika from, from Georgia is uh, raising his hand. Uh, please, can you unmute, your, unmute yourself? So, <clears throat> hi again, everybody. So, the wonderful presentation. So, um, I just really want to comment on the <clears throat> Francesca's question on the, about uh, assembling and getting all the data together. So, I think the, uh, from the Georgian perspective, for um, uh, how we did that. So first of all, uh, let me start with the hepatitis C data. So we are running the national hepatitis C elimination program. And, and I think it's it's important part that um, uh, of running this program was to establishing the national health information system that gets all the data for the uh, for each patient that has been treated in the program. So I think it's it's pretty much in the line with um, WHO strategy on the global strategy for viral hepatitis. So. I think it's accomplishing the having the, the, the good granulated data for any program that is running uh, in the country is very important. So, so that, that was the first thing that was uh, make us uh, make it possible for us to submit this data. Uh, another important point for the hepatitis C elimination program. So I think that uh, the, the goal of the program is not just just to achieve the elimination in the country, but it's just to share our experience with others. So it's a, uh, it's uh, it's about the lessons learned from our other programs. So in the and the program uh, which is run by the the government of Georgia, and uh, after all, so it's 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 really willing to share all our the experiences with with others. And and I think that you know, the analysis really uh, shown by the, the Lars has been really uh, um, highlighting that, 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 that elimination is possible um, and that the drugs really work. And I think that supporting further use of the pan-genotypic regimens that really uh, simplify the treatment and uh, treatment procedures uh, really can make it in the lower income countries as well, lower and middle income countries as well. So I think it's uh, it's, I think that's an that's, that's important contribution from our Georgia's National Hepatitis C elimination. 
So, and I think that the Lars has talked about uh, the hit step and, uh, and the, the programs uh, the chip has been um, has been running for the international cohort study. So, I think that um, the being involved in the, the in collaboration with Europe with the chip uh, with, the, with the programs run by chip really helped us just to be uh, to be in uh, to be on the on the on the same side as the, the rest of the Europe. So, I think that um, yeah, I would like to very much thanks. Uh, Dr. Lundgren and entire chip, chip team for getting the you know, involved the Eastern European countries in this pan-European collaborations because it's it's really important for um, uh, for considering the doublet of European region as an entire region and not dividing them into the sub-regions and um, yeah, it's 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 really uh, it's really appreciable from our side uh, because uh, because it brings us closer to the standards that is. That we are uh, that we are looking for uh, for HIV hepatitis and TB care uh, across the European regions from west to the east. Thank you. Thank you, Nika, for for excellent uh, comment. I think it's uh, we are approaching the the last minute of uh, of this session, and maybe just uh, as a final uh, comment to to Lars, I would like to acknowledge once again the the data that we have from the from the Eurocida cohort, which is one of the largest uh, HIV uh, cohort, and uh, specifically the data on the HIV HCV co-infection is uh, we still use it as a reference, and uh, we'll be happy if uh, if there will be any further updates on, on this uh, um, from this cohort. But um, I think uh, I think there was a great session, and thanks also for um, for Francesca for. Uh, and for Marina for 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 co-moderating, and uh, we are going uh, for a lunch break, 45 minutes. So we are back at uh, two o'clock uh, Copenhagen time and uh, three o'clock Moscow time, if I'm correct. And there will be a uh, very exciting panel discussion after the break. And uh, have a good lunch and see you. Thank you.